A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Rise of the Drones, Unmanned Systems and the Future of War will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection so ordered, I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record without objection so ordered. Good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to see all of you here. I apologize that I was a bit late and uh, neither Mr. Flake and I had much time to spend with you before you came, but we think we'll get fully acquainted through your, uh, acquainted through your testimony uh, and your comments on that in the question and answer period. I certainly hope that's the case. Our hearing today introduces a new topic to the subcommittee, uh, the risk of the rise, rather, of unmanned systems and their implications for United States national security. Over the last decade, the number of unmanned systems and their applications has grown rapidly. So too is the number of operational, political, and legal questions associated with the technology. To illustrate the wide variety of unmanned systems and some of their applications, we wanted to share some short video clips. Video one is an unmanned system ranging from the harmless to the lethal. The first system is clearly on the harmless side of the spectrum. <laughs> I, I know from first-hand experience that uh, that's made in my district, at iRobot, of, of course, and uh, the the not the cat, the, uh, <laughs> the robot uh, is over there. Uh, video two shows that other systems provide support to our war fighters. Uh, this particular slide is the Ripsaw MS-1, a remote gun tank that can travel at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour and can carry a payload of up to 2,000 pounds. As you'll see, it can also be used to pull vehicles and other items that are potential security risks. Video three is known as the Big Dog, a four-legged robot that can walk through sand, snow, and ice while carrying up to 340 pounds on its back and serving as a robotic pack mule. As you'll see, it can retain its balance on uneven surfaces and can handle rough terrain. Looks like a dance class gone bad. <laughs> and video four is the Raven UAV, is used primarily for surveillance. And as you'll see, it's, it's hand launched and remote controlled from the field. The editor of Wired Magazine recently, recently built a homemade version of the Raven for around $1,000. That is, of course, what you're seeing from the Raven's equipment. It wasn't the Raven making that buzzing noise either. It, was, uh, it basically means that we're going to have votes in a short while, and uh, what we'll do is we'll probably finish our opening remarks and then break, hopefully briefly, for uh, a couple of votes and come back. We apologize. We can probably expect that to happen a little bit throughout the afternoon. The last and final clip shows the most lethal side of unmanned systems. Some of you may be familiar with footage similar to this. This is unclassified footage from an Army uh, unmanned aerial vehicle engaging combatants in Iraq.
The growing demand for and the reliance on unmanned systems has serious implications both on and off the battlefield. As the United States is engaged in two wars abroad, unmanned systems, particularly unmanned aerial vehicles, have become a centerpiece of that war effort. In recent years, the Department of Defense's UAV inventory has rapidly grown in size from 167 in 2002 to over 7,000 today. Last year, for the first time, the United States Air Force trained more unmanned pilots than traditional fighter pilots. Some express no doubt that unmanned systems have been a boost to U.S. war efforts in the Middle East and South Asia. CIA Director Leon Panetta said last May, and I quote, drone strikes are the only game in town in terms of confronting or trying to disrupt the al-Qaeda leadership, close quote. Media reports over the last year indicating that the top two leaders of the Pakistani Taliban were killed by drone strikes also are used to support that argument. But some critics argue that drone strikes are unethical at best and counterproductive at worst. They point to the reportedly high rate of civilian casualties, which has been calculated by the New American Foundation to be around 32 percent, and argue that the strikes do more to stoke anti-Americanism than they do to weaken our enemies. A quick skim of any Pakistani newspaper provides some evidence to support this theory. This is particularly relevant in the era of counterinsurgency doctrine, a central tenet of which is first do no harm. It also may be the case that we are fighting wars with modern technology under an antiquated set of laws. For example, if the United States uses unmanned syst weapon systems, does that require an official declaration of war or an authorization for the use of force? Do the Geneva Conventions, written in 1949, govern the prosecution of an unmanned war? Who is considered a lawful combat in unmanned war, the Air Force pilot flying a predator from thousands of miles away in Nevada, or the civilian contractor servicing it on the airstrip in Afghanistan? If unmanned systems are changing the way that we train our military personnel, so too should they change the way that we respond to the stress of combat. We already know that unmanned pilots are showing signs of equal or greater stress from combat compared to traditional pilots. The stress of fighting a war thousands of miles away, then minutes later joining your family at the dinner table, presents mental health challenges that must be addressed. On the domestic front, manufacturers have already developed a number of unmanned commercial products and are likely to find more applications for this technology in the future. From vacuum cleaners to crop dusters, traditional items that require manual operation are rapidly being rendered obsolete by unmanned technology. UAVs are now being used for environmental monitoring, particularly in hard-to-reach places like the North Pole. Last fall, the University of North Dakota charted a four-year degree program in UAV piloting. These trends are already forcing us to ask new questions about domestic airspace regulation. Who is allowed to own unmanned systems and where they are allowed to operate? Additionally, as more law enforcement and border security services come to use unmanned systems, important questions continue to emerge about the protection of privacy. As this technology develops and becomes more commercially available, we must implement adequate measures to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. At least 40 other countries are currently developing unmanned te systems technology, including Iran, Russia, and China. We already know that during the Israeli-Lebanon War in 2006, Hezbollah deployed three surveillance UAVs that it acquired from Iran. A recent Air Force study concluded that a UAV is an ideal platform for a chemical or biological terrorist attack. As Peter Singer, one of our witnesses today, wrote recently in Newsweek, and I quote, for less than $50,000, a few amateurs could shut down Manhattan, close quote. We have to ensure that the appropriate government agencies are coordinating their efforts to prevent this technology from proliferating and falling into the wrong hands, and also to ensure that we have adequate homeland security measures to respond to those threats. Finally, as the new technology continues to develop, we must ensure that there are adequate measures in place to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse in the acquisition process. A 2009 study by the United States Government Accountability Office, the offer of which we'll hear from today, reported significant cost growth, schedule delays, and performance shortfalls in DOD's UAV acquisition process. This analysis raises serious concerns, and I look forward to learning more on this from both the General Accountability Office and the Department of Defense witnesses appearing before us. These are some of the questions that we'll begin to answer at this hearing. Surely, we're not going to have to, a conclusion to all of those questions during this afternoon's single day of conversation. But I hope that this hearing serves as a thorough introduction to the topic for the purpose of educating and informing our members as well as the American public. With that, I'd like to defer to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the chairman. <clears throat> I wish we had a couple of drones that could go and vote for us so we wouldn't have to uh, go and then come back. But uh, 
afraid we have to do it ourselves. Um, to many, the increased number of suspected terrorists killed between 2008 and 2009 indicates that the Obama administration has used UAV technology with great success. At the same time, uh, while DOD is carrying out UAV missions, others in the administration are disputing the legality of their own tactics and avoiding taking personal responsibility for them. Such discord within the administration could open the door to a number of legal questions and perhaps put an entire army or um, entire arm of our military strategy in Afghanistan and Pakistan at risk. I'm hopeful that today's uh, hearings will shed some light on this and uh, we can see a way forward. And I thank the chairman for holding the hearing. Thank you. Now, with that, we'll recess for probably about a half hour if, if the witnesses want to get a cold drink or something while we're doing that. And we should be back uh, about quarter two or maybe just a little bit after that. Thank you.